Well, it was great to have you talk about Trevor and the Art of Belief. I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. And I'm also touching on Lamont Young, so it's as if they planned this. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me speak today. Um, and I want to give a special thanks um, to... Oh, hold on one moment. Got it? Great. Thank you. Um, no. Um, to, uh, to those that helped um, the exhibition come about, um, Levi Jackson, thank you, uh, Chase Westfall, thank you, uh, Kirk Richards and Allison and Gina who installed the entire crystal wall, that took three people and nine hours. Um, Brian and Faith Krishiznik who showed up at 11 p.m. Um, after we had been installing since 8 a.m. and stayed until 2 p.m. with us. Um, and Jeff and Carrie Decker, hats off to you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the cool things that you won't know, that while we were installing the Rhino, um, we were pushing it all around Riverside Church, and at one point, um, and like seasoned New Yorkers were stopping to talk to us, like, what is that? And a tour bus drove by, and we're waving, and uh, Jeff told me to get on top and act like I was like the, um, the beauty queen of the Mormon Art Center Festival. And <laughs> I suggested that I have like a studded bra or something, <laughs> Wavy. I declined gracefully, um, but did ride inside the cavity of the rhino while we um, pushed it around. Um, so we had fun, is the moral of the story. Um, today, uh, my comments will focus on three areas. First, I want to recount the history of Mormon art festivals. While some of you may think that this is the first one, so where is the history? Uh, get ready, you may be surprised. Um, I'll then continue to discuss the definition of Mormon art, which has been touched on and um, interrogated and played around with, um, and I'm gonna give you eight various definitions and uh, you can determine which one you want. Uh, and finally, I'll discuss how the Mormon Art Center Festival or, and the possible future Mormon Art Center and its associated projects could look to the Jewish Museum as an example. Does this look familiar, Nathan? <laughs> it's like you just talked about it. It's in the air. This is Trevor and the first brochure to the very first exhibition of the Art of Lead um, show. You lost me? This is why it does not look familiar, why there was a puzzled look instead. <laughs> um, much, I'll let you do that, but much of yesterday's superb lectures grappled with, uh, in part, I will try, I will not touch it. Thank you. Um, uh, much of yesterday's superb lectures grappled with, in part, President Kimball's Education for Eternity, Gospel Vision of the Arts. Um, some lectures problematized Kimball's grandiose vision, um, while others discussed it as a turning point in Mormon culture. The festival promotional material passed out to potential donors to garner support, dubbed Kimball's words as groundbreaking. But if Kimball's gospel vision of the art was groundbreaking, it was in part because it fell on very ripe soil. As Nathan discussed before me, the Art and Belief movement at BYU began in 1964. The movement was led by our professor Dale Fletcher, um, who was the mentor to these three teachers, and is referenced, but not in the movie that you saw. Not in that section. Not in that section. <laughs> uh, and included artists such as Trevor Southey, Denner Smith, and uh, Gary Smith, um, whom you are well familiar with. Um, as the name of the movement suggests, these individuals explored ways of merging their religious beliefs with their artistic practice. They began exhibiting together annually starting in 1966. Kimball shows up in 1967 uh, to give education for eternity. BYU uh, took Kimball's words as directive. And with Lauren Wheelwright, uh, Dean of the College of the Fine Arts at the helm, and in partnership with the already ex exhibiting Mormon art, uh, art and Belief members, the university almost immediately started organizing a festival of Mormon art in reaction to Kimball's uh, speech. <laughs> uh, later changed to the Mormon Arts Festival uh, to be held in the newly built Harris Fine Arts Center. And the existing Art and Belief exhibitions merged with the festival. 
In Wheelwright's proposal to the president of the university asking for support, he said, we believe that the time, uh, we believe that now is the right time to act. And I cannot tell you how um, that language actually mirrors so much of this talk at the advisory board meeting that we had early Wednesday afternoon. So much of it said, uh, so many of those members said, it feels right. 2017 feels right. This is the moment. Um, they also felt like it was the moment in 1967. Um, from the beginning, a commitment to explore a wide spectrum of art was central to the festival's plan. In an unpublished proposal for the 1969 exhibition, Dale Fletcher, then chairman of the exhibition committee, wrote, but any attempt to forecast the form and style of the new world art is bound to fail. It will be new in ways we cannot imagine, and it may also reach back to the past for inspiration and for a sense of community. He goes on to propose an interpretive Lehigh's dream that's immersive, that has music and dance, and that you enter in, it's participatory, um, that uh, was never actualized um, because of logistics. Um, but they, uh, anyway, so it's left on the table. The exhibition was called The Wise Heart. It was an invitational um, and a juried show. And on May 1st, 1969, at the conclusion of the festival, Fletcher drafted a letter to participants participating artists describing the exhibition as containing work that was very diversified in medium, treatment and quality, and related to the latest contemporary art forms. The 1961 festival lasted a full two weeks, and the theater schedule alone included ongoing dramatic sketches of Mormon personalities and three plays with multiple night performances, The Apostate by Orson Scott Card, which received mixed reviews, the Tragedy of Korhor, and oddly, Hamlet. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, you know, what was interesting, uh, Card was 20 when he wrote that play, and there's all these correspondence between critics writing to the dean saying, you know, we're calling for his head, don't let him take a stage. And, um, and Wheelwright said, ah, I think this is a guy that deserves to be encouraged. I think I said with Wheelwright. Um, by 1972, just three years after the first festival had been organized, a book titled Mormon Arts, Volume 1, behind in my slides, these are just, you have a designer, they'll do these fancy things for you. <laughs> um, this is just a collage of brochures. This is the book. Uh, by 1972, just three years after the first festival had been organized, a book titled Mormon Arts, Volume 1, was published, edited, edited by Wheelwright. On its cover, set as the frontispiece of Mormon art, is a painting that depicts two bodies draped in blood, soaked white clothing. They lie on the ground outside of Carthage jail, and one body is in the process of being gently lifted, carried tenderly by four men, while another watches close with his head bowed. This is Gary Smith's Martyrdom. The subtitle of the book is an interesting choice, in part because volume two has still yet to be followed and will not be written by those who drafted the first and assumed that it was a volume, uh, a sequential volume set. But its inclusion, as the subtitle suggests, two things to me. One, that the publication from its very conception was viewed as just the beginning, and two, that Wheelwright and other contributors hope that for future scholarship and publications would certainly come. In part, <clears throat> making the catalog a volume released the authors from the responsibility to be comprehensive, and it allowed for an open canon. Did it go blank again? To readers, researchers, and scholars today, the subtitle of volume one presents a challenge and a call to write subsequent volumes. The early years of the Festival of Mormon Art was an ambitious time, a time when the confluence of Mormon belief and artistic practice were discussed critically, depicted variously, and celebrated yearly. Yet the festival struggled in their focus throughout the 1980s for various reasons and ended in 1987. Some fragmented aspects and momentum of these festivals moved on the national level and continue, at least in part, into the 20th century and today. Um, describing the makeup of festivals during this time, Lauren Wheelwright said, although visiting artists had added color and interest to this endeavor, the majority of the work has come from the faculty and student body of BYU. 
These noteworthy inclusions of visiting artists, well not the role, were significant moves that helped widen the scope of the festival. Among those invited is our very own uh, Jorge Coco San Angelo, who is here with us today, uh, and who is included in this show. He's the only artist to be included in those festivals and in this festival today. Um, <clears throat> yet, with mo if most of the work came from faculty and student body, eventually the festival would, by nature, stagnate. And as, reflected, as it reflected a mirror of their own making, preached to the choir. While the festival struggled with diversity in terms of participants, as it progressed, it also became more diverse in subject matter. In Images of Faith, uh, Art of the Latter-day Saints, published in 1995, the church, at the Church History Museum, then the Church History Museum curator, Robert Davis, criticized the festivals, saying that the more inclusive they became in their definition of Mormon art, namely the inclusion of work that didn't have explicit Mormon subject matter or wasn't by Mormon artists, the less topical and weak the festivals became. He said, with the 12th Mormon Arts Festival held the year of the sesquicentennial um, of the organization of the church came a change in philosophy. The show's catalog explained, rather than limiting our view to art with Mormon subject matter, we must include any art that serves to amplify high moral values visually, regardless of subject matter. Therein lies true Mormon art. This trend continued. I hit it. Okay, good. It's still up. <laughs> this trend continued in subsequent annual exhibitions, and David Davis cites the 1983 festival in which the promotional materials said that the art need not be limited to Mormon subject matter. We simply desire that it exemplify significance and excellence in art. In addition to the example provided by Davis, there lies other evidence to support his claim. By 1984, the, words of the, Mor the word Mormon was dropped altogether from the festival's name and changed to simply the Brigham Young University Fine Art Exhibition. And by 1987, the last festival was simply called 18th Annual BYU Art Show. Maybe the ending of the Mormon Arts Festival had less to do with its perceived misdirection as um, as accused or as pointed at by uh, Robert Davis, or even the understandable fatigue of the university and its arts faculty, and more to do with the opening of the Church History Museum in 1984, okay, in 1984, and the BYU Museum of Art in 1993. And uh, this symbol may look familiar to you. Um, as it derives from the festivals, uh, and this logo maintains. And if you want to learn more about it, Mark Madley is here, and I'm sure he can tell you. <laughs> um, uh, these two museums provided institutional outlets and funding that um, achieved much of the festival's goals. Juried shows that focused on religious art created by Mormons certainly continued, and according to historian and founding curator of both museums, and presenter at our conference today, Paul L., our, our conference yesterday, Paul L. Anderson, triennial churchwide art competition sponsored by the church, by the Museum of the Church History and Art, um, began in 1987, attracted thousands of artists from around the world with recognition, cash prizes, and purchase awards. These exhibitions, together with the museum's active collecting program, have brought attention to the artists and artisans from diverse cultures, reflecting their Mormon identity through their own traditions. Certainly, the ending of the arts festivals resulted in a combination of factors. But the criticism, both internal and external, regarding the identity, direction, and definition of Mormon art remained both fraught and current. What is Mormon art? And we're going to pause. You're going to talk to your neighbor. I'm going to give you five minutes. You, I'd like to know what you think. Um, go. Try and answer the question. <laughs>
self-identify as Mormon art, but you were raised Mormon, does it then become not Mormon art? We're going to talk about that. Yes, do you have another definition? Yeah, no, I have to run back to the question. Okay. I, I, might, I guess I wonder, like, how do you um, Mormonism and Christianity kind of coexist? Like, how do you get them to be consciously? Right. Right, and I think Jeremy would, would quarrel with, with Glenn. Lamont doesn't self-identify as Mormon, but is reading all the Mormon themes, and then he decides, no, they're not in there. So, <laughs> it's slippery, it's a slippery slope. Mm, no, <laughs> so my parents are raising their hand. <laughs> I'm not gonna call on that. <laughs> hey, one more, yes. <laughs> I think it can, there's a clear split between is it done by a Mormon, created by a Mormon, and second, is it reflective of the values, doctrines, history, and cultural aspects of the LDS Church? Right. And I think you have to separate it in two camps and then decide what works for you. For me, does the work reflect the spirit? Right. And can that be, does it necessarily have to be done by a Mormon to be spiritual art? Does it reflect the spirit, whether it's a landscape, whether it's a picture of descent from the cross, whether you, does it reflect the spirit? To me, that's spiritual art, which is what I hope to find within Mormon art. Right, so there's uh, art that reflects Mormon spirit, and art done by Mormons, that for you falls into their umbrella of Mormon art. Well, let's, let's explore some other definitions, and I want you to keep having this conversation. There's a nice lunch break right after this, so you have two hours to keep asking yourself this question. And to maybe say, no, I don't think Laura was right either. <laughs> Definition, we're going through eight, in addition to the ones already proposed or problematized. Spencer Kimball, I don't know if you've heard of him, but um, <laughs> kind of, uh, had some ideas. Artists must be faithful, inspired, active church members to give life and feeling and true perspective to a subject so worthy. Our writers and motion picture specialists with the inspiration of heaven should be tomorrow, uh, should tomorrow be able to produce a masterpiece which would live forever. Our own talent obsession with dyna dynamism for, for a cause, all caps, cause, uh, could put into such a story life and heartbeat and emotions and love and pathos, drama, suffering, fear, and courage. Kimball wanted the most faithful to produce work, and he felt that the faith would not only reveal their strong testimonies, but enhance their work, that their testimonies would endow their work with a significant spirit of authenticity, belief, and power. Kimball's words are, prof are a prophetic vision and a call for church members, but they do not attempt to define Mormon art. Um, as an institutional curator, some questions emerge for me. What happens within this criteria when an artist chooses another path? Is the artwork then orphaned by the artist who leaves? Does the art then cease to have the power once described by Kimball? Or must the work fall away along with its maker? Of course, a definition of Mormon art need not be static or monolithic. Lauren Wheelwright, 
who you met in the first part of the presentation, editor of Mormon Artist Volume 1, wrote that he felt that the definition of Mormon art has always been in flux. Of his book, he said, the reader is cautioned not to draw final conclusions from this volume. It does not presume to delimit Mormon art. He continues later, writing, a precise definition of Mormon art still remains an open question. The works themselves best respect their distinguished characteristics. They demonstrate two basic concepts. They stress the importance of finding and possessing truth and beauty, truth and beauty, <laughs> wherever they exist, and others stress unique Mormon values and a way of expressing them in aesthetic form. Going to yours. Other scholars have noted that as Mormon population becomes more diverse, diverse so too should the definition of Mormon art. Returning to our friend Paul, in the Oxford Handbook of Mormonism published in 2015, he wrote in the late 20th 20th century, it also became clear that the definition of Mormon arts needed to be expanded to embrace a wider variety of expressions of an increasing international membership. Commenting on the increasing diversity definition of what it means to be a Mormon, Anderson felt that there was a need to reflect that, growing aesthetic, that, that growth aesthetically. In his 2007 book, People of Paradox, A History of Mormon Culture, Terrell Gibbons wrote, today, only 14% of Mormons live in Utah, and Mormonism, at the beginning of the 21st century, achieved a balance of its members that weighed more heavily with non-Americans than with Americans. So while Utah art has long been code for Mormon art, in the 21st century, that short change corollary is now far from accurate. In his introductory book, uh, Art and Belief and Meaning, published in association with the symposium on the same topic, BYU Museum, hit the space button. <laughs> then BYU Museum art educator Herman Toy wrote, early attempts have been made by Latter-day Saint artists to arrive at a definable approach to art and art making that would also reflect a Latter-day Saint worldview. Yet he explains that that worldview is rarely singular. The disparate array of interest, concerns, and points of view expressed by Latter-day Saint writers clearly indicate that there is no unique Mormon art on the horizon nor in this foreseeable future. Artists, as unique and autonomous individuals, contribute their di differing perspectives in terms of what is relevant and significant to their perception and understanding. Apart from the treatment of specific subjects, there is no evidence of a unique or consolidated vision that has accrued to artists uh, in the church or to warrant the designation of a new style or movement. There's some confused faces. Brett, dis Brett you disagree. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I agree with the toy in part. I don't think there is a single style or aesthetic that can be described as uniquely Mormon, uh, one that you could identify simply by looking at it as a trained eye could of an Italian Renaissance painting. The voices of the Mormon people aren't cohesive enough. Dutoy continues, yet while there is no shared marker of the style or singular voice, there is a shared identifier of what it means to both be a Mormon and be an artist. Speaking of the distinct characteristics that define the Mormon experience, Givens in People of Paradox writes, a radical theology emphasizing chosenness and exclusive stewardship over divine truth and authority, a history of persecution and an alienation from the American mainstream, together with an enormous institutional demands of religious commitment, personal sacrifice, and distinctive religious practice, have welded the, uh, that the adherents of Mormonism into a people who so powerfully identify with one another as a community that one writer, Thomas O'Day, did not hesitate to call them the only instance in American history of a people who became almost an ethnic community. We are almost an ethnic community. <laughs> um, my slides were out of order. Um, this was extremely interesting to me when my father-in-law and brother-in-law um, had their DNA tested. My father-in-law is from Peru, as his genes clearly indicate. <laughs> uh, it had a genetic breakdown, you know, 10% African, 15% Italian, 11% um, indigenous, um, 
And then at the bottom, it had this, you know, thing that we were, you know, confirmed. Yay, he's Peruvian. <laughs> very likely. But my brother-in-law had this very strange thing. 50% similar genetic breakdown. But at the bottom, he had this very weird thing. Genetic community. Mormon pioneers in the Mountain West. Connection, very likely. Is this a genetic community? The same as, as one has a national identity as Peruvian, as Ecuadorian, as Bolivian, as Chilean? I'm not sure. But the test clearly proves. <laughs> I think it's a problematic thing. And I think nation and identity are slipping things. One of the things that my husband always jokes about is, he says my like cocktail party line to make me sound like very interesting was that I was born in Bogota. Um, and I was. I've announced it all to all these people. <laughs> Um, but sometimes I tease, tease my kids to say, well, if you're 25% Peruvian because your grandfather was born in Peru, you must also be 50% Colombian because your mother was born in Colombia. <laughs> and, you know, being children, they have no sense of humor and their hands are all up in arms. No, 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 mom, that's not how identity is meant. Um, I just need to problematize it, that it's complicated. Let's turn to root beer. Gibbon's claim of Mormonism as an almost ethnic community certainly speaks to a, cohesive, uh, a, to a cohesiveness of a people with a shared experience. This feeling of otherness is also described in Joanna Brooks' Book of Mormon Girl as being a root beer among Cokes. Now, I drink Coke, so that's a little, you know, neither here nor there, but a root beer among Cokes will stick with her metaphor as a sparkling internal difference that she relished in as a young child, supporting Gibbon's claim of ethnic, eth ethnicity. Uh, Brooks points out to common Mormon last names like Allred, Mom and Dad, <laughs> Hatch, Rigby, Ricks, Tanner, Cannon, and Young. With such telling last names, it can be nearly impossible to match one's religious and pioneer heritage, particularly in knowing circles. Um, and also another story. Um, when I was a teenager, we drove to Utah to visit you know, the motherland, or fatherland, as, it, as the case was. In that. And we went to Spring City. And my dad said, these, these are where the all reds are. These are your all red people. And we were looking for the cemetery, and we couldn't find any pulled over. And, Put, popped his head out of the door and said, hey, I'm John Allred, do you know where the cemetery is? And the random kid said, that's my dad's name. <laughs> and pointed us away. Um, I, again, all supporting these claims of this pioneer heritage, this pioneer ethnic identity. However, perceived religious ethnicity being almost an ethnic community is quite different than um, a lived racial ethnicity. One can easily cease to be a Mormon, can pass, can assimilate, can disavow an inherited or an adopted identity, then one can cast off race. Stony Brook art historian Amanda Beardsley prefers to look at work produced or commissioned by church headquarters as the standard of Mormon art. For her, institutional output is more significant because, it brought in, because of its broad cultural influence. Church produced images are distributed in mass and created a brand look, whereas the works by lay Mormons simply have a less, less audience. She says, illustrations included in the scripture struck me as the best examples of Mormon art because they are what most immediately tells non-Mormons who Mormons are. Images that are used to teach others about the LDS are the ones that most exemplify an aesthetic particular to Mormonism. Now let's problematize this. This is the Gospel Art Kit, distributed in mass. That's not a Mormon artist, or is it? This is Carl Block. <laughs> Turning to Glenn. Who used Glenn's definition? Let's go there, shall we? Okay. For Glenn Nelson, writer and founder of the Mormon Artist Group in Manhattan, whom you may be familiar with, uh, this definition is more of, of Mormon art is more expansive. If you self-identify as Mormon, 
and you're making art, then the art you're making is Mormon art. For him, the subject doesn't need to be explicitly religious, nor must it tackle Mormon iconography. Rather, if you resonate with Mormonism to the point that you self-identify as Mormon, which may or may not mean that you are practicing, then your art is, by extension, Mormon. Let me explain this in pop cultural terms. Per Nelson's definition, Ryan Gosling's performance in La La Land would not be termed Mormon art because Gosling has said that he never really could identify with Mormonism, even though he was born and raised one. Conversely, actress Katherine Hagel, who in response to being asked why she was not living with her boyfriend, said, I still have enough Mormon in me, not a lot, but enough that I want to keep that a little sacred. She calls herself a quasi-Mormon. With Nelson's definition, all of Heigl's performances, from Grey's Anatomy to Knocked Up, would be Mormon art. <laughs> or at the very least, quasi-Mormon art. All of Marie Osmond's, you know, Osmond's performances would also be considered Mormon art. Now for one caveat. Nelson's definition applies to a narrow uh, field of art, and he said, I'm not really extending it to pop culture, um, and the scholarship today doesn't extend that far, but I think the metaphor works. Um, and I think these familiar examples are instructive to consider the fluidity of identity and how that identity might affect the art that they're making. Let's pause for a minute to show you a very important video. <laughs> of a steak, and I don't, I don't need sound for this, it really is okay. <laughs> um, oh, it just works. <laughs> All right, um, we'll just let that play in the background for a minute. Um, this is Ryan Gosling's um, dance performance uh, at his um, home road show. Um, <clears throat> so Nelson's definition allows for a wider tent of makers and forms, and unlike Kimball and Wheelwright's definition, it frees aesthetic objects from the call to preach. Suddenly, Mormon art becomes a much larger field. It's hard to be taken seriously, <laughs> but it's fun. I'm going to keep it played. <laughs> Uh, among my favorites that Nelson unearthed, okay, wait, let me, um, so, suddenly Mormon art becomes a much larger field, tangered from messaging, and with many, many more participants. Among my favorite that Nelson unearthed to me, along with, uh, uh, was Lamont Young, um, who was a member of the Flexus Movement, and along with other famous figures, such as Yoko Ono, but his work would most likely not appear um, on a Janice Cat Perry album. <laughs> However, on Nelson's list of Mormon art is also John Held, one of the first cartoonists for the New York River Magazine. While Held's topic and subject are not explicitly Mormon, Nelson often finds Mormon themes suggested in the cartoons and titles. Part of the purpose of expanding the definition of Mormon art, um, <laughs> sorry, of Mormon art and uh, Mormon artists and art is to bring Mormons out of obscurity and out of Utah and to recognize their long and rich history, and to see them on players as the on the national and international stage. Let's return to this international stage. Oscar-nominated worthy. <clears throat> this research approach is not singular to Mormonism, however. In 1966, responding to the then upcoming exhibition, The Jew in America, art critic Harold Rosenberg said, all national minorities, not just Mormons, all national minorities use this type of research as a basis to establish the fact that they are an asset to America and have a right to be respected. That other national minorities, mi minorities take this approach of expanding the definition of their identity is interesting to me, but I quarrel with Rosenberg on one regard. Proving that our community has value to America is not necessarily the purpose or the work of Mormon art. That has already long been done by business professionals and politicians. Thank you, Mitt Romney. <laughs> um, rather, for Nelson, the purpose of having an expansive definition of Mormon art is to draw out and examine our history for ourselves. 
However, as with Crimble's definition, in getting to Brett's point, or your point, falsely attributed, sorry, um, Nelson's definition can leave work orphaned. Did young Ryan Gosling's performance in his Ward Roadshow, as we all watched, lose its status of Mormon art when he defrocked himself from his, his inherited religious traditions? Any definition is inherently problematic because it creates boundaries and otherness. An apple is defined as a round fruit from a tree from the rose family that can typically has thin red, red or green skins and crisp flesh. It has variety, Gala, Fuji, Red Delicious, Granny Smith, but it can never be an orange and never be called Valencia. Likewise, in forming a list of who is in and who is out under Nelson's parameters of Mormon art, the determining factor is that you must be Mormon. Finally, oh, I never showed you this slide. But here you go. That's Harold Rosenberg. <laughs> Finally, there's a definition by Anne from Hatch, an architectural programmer who worked with BYU planning, the planning department for 25 years and whose final project was to help realize the BYU Jerusalem Center. Whatever his relationship to the festivals of, in the 1960s and 70s, and um, I, I was never unclear, but this proposal for Mormon art centers was found in Dean Wheelwright's papers in the BYU um, archive. He writes, um, uh, he proposes that centers containing Mormon art be placed at select locations around the world. He writes, by definition, Mormon art may be described as art which is created by Mormons, art which is created for the Mormons, or art which is created about the Mormons. Under this definition, those who self-identify as Mormons are included, but also so are others. The makers of the acclaimed but controversial Book of Mormon musical would also be considered Mormon artists, as would their non-Mormon illustrators in the 1960s, including Tom Lovell, John Scott, and uh, Harry Anderson. Um, on this point, when I was talking to President Uchtdorf uh, on Wednesday, he said, is Heiner Kaufman a Mormon artist? And he said, maybe definitions don't matter. And I, I, think, I think that's an interesting point, asking whether Heiner Kaufman is a Mormon artist, and said we needed to get beyond Arnold Freeberg. I agree. <laughs> In terms of how these definitions, oh, sorry, hold on. Um, Harry Anderson is an interesting point. He, his work is in every ward building, in every temple, and under so many of these definitions, he would not count. But how could he not be a Mormon artist, although he's Seventh-day Adventist? It becomes a problem. Um, because he himself is not Mormon, his work is excluded from most definitions of what constitutes Mormon art. Yet his work, his influence in shaping the everyday Mormon worship experience cannot be denied. In terms of how these definitions are used, depends on tastemakers and institutions to either use existing modes of thought or to write their own. This festival, this exhibition, this catalog, um, uh, the catalog used primarily an, amal an amalgamation of Nelson and Hatch. Yet when meeting with the Mormon Arts Center advisory board after a lengthy discussion of definitions, many expressed a need to keep the definition of Mormon art, at least at the very beginning, as wide as possible. When deciding on an inclusive, uh, an inclusive uh, approach, the co-directors of the festival and the Mormon Arts Advisory Board used the Jewish Museum of New York City as a model. And the advisory board, uh, why you don't see Richard here this morning, or Glenn, uh, or Claudia, is that they are all, right now, at the Jewish Museum. In fact, the plans and hopes for the future of the Mormon Arts Center were so much inspired by the Jewish Museum, that the more, oh, that's it, they're there. Oh, I wrote it down, just in case I forgot. <laughs> why? Why go to the Jewish Museum? Why? Why is that a model? Uh, the Jewish Museum is an art museum and a repository of Jewish cultural artifacts. Its collection focuses on Jewish history as well as modern and contemporary art. Further, the museum has influence. Its exhibition history is rich, experimental, and influential, not just for a Jewish audience. Rather, the museum is seen as a significant contributor, contributor in shaping the culture of a much larger art world, according to its mission statement. 
the Jewish Museum is dedicated to the enjoyment, understanding, and preservation of the artistic and cultural heritage of the Jewish people through its unparalleled collection, distinguished exhibitions, and, and education programming. Using art and artifacts that embody the diversity of the Jewish experience from the ancient to the present times throughout the world, the museum strives to be a source of inspiration and shared human value for the people of all religious and cultural backgrounds, while serving as a special touchstone of identity for the Jewish people. As a vital cultural resource for New York residents and visual vis visitors of all ages, the museum also reaches out to a national and international communities as it interprets and preserves the Jewish culture for current and future generations. So what do its exhibitions look like? <clears throat> for example, uh, uh, it currently has a show up called Charlemagne Palestine, Bear Mitzvah. You should go see this. It's entire room filled with stuffed animal bears. It's so amazing. Uh, and another show, uh, The Arcades, Contemporary Art and Walter Benjamin. These slides are taken from that show. The Arcades exhibition is a perfect example of showcasing non-Jewish artists in a way that is still relevant to Jewish culture. Cultural theorist Walter Benjamin was Jewish and was in the midst of writing The Arcade Project, which was sort of his uh, like magnus opus, uh, his like defining project. About, uh, which is about the 19th century Paris, um, which he talked about the arcades as a metaphor for the city and for um, cultural economy. Um, when he died um, as a result of suicide, when he was fleeing Nazi persecution at the age of 48. Artwork in the exhibition respond to Benjamin's writings. However, some of the artists are not Jewish. Wally Beshti, Walker Evans, Pierre V, uh, Chris Burden, to name a few. I'm not advocating for secularization here, but I am suggesting that part of the Jewish Museum's success lies in their willingness to allow others to tell their story, while simultaneously holding on to its central goal of serving as a special touchstone of identity for the Jewish people. As Mormons, we are not alone in our search for a working definition of art. Defining definitions of Jewish art are also debated, most notably by art critic Harold Rosenberg, who gave a 1966 address, and note the date, one year before um, President Kimball, at the Jewish Museum, titled, Is There Jewish Art? In that address, he said, still, Jewish creation in art has been, I think I have this here, here we go. Still, Jewish creation in art, art has been very vital in this century, and the important thing that is that while Jewish artists have not been creating as Jews, they have not been working as non-Jews either. Their art has been the closest ex expression of who they are, including the fact that they are Jews, each in his or her individual degree. An in, in an interesting parallel, in 2016, a symposium, an exhibition, similarly called the Jewish Art Festival, was organized to respond to and commemorate the 50th anniversary of Rosenberg's address. Uh, how am I in time? I see parallels also to American art. Uh, American art was perceived as not a thing, uh, you know, even um, even in the, as as late as the '60s. Um, Rosenberg wrote about it. He said the same problem with Jewish art or Mormon art, for that matter. That was my ad. <laughs> um, exists in regards to, to American art. I have been attacked in Europe and in England, really, for saying that there is an American art. American art, according to some critics, is simply a development of European art. American painting in the past 20 years has been surrealist, expressionist, pop. It has no specific American quality. And indeed, a young professor at the University, University of Pennsylvania who tried to isolate what is visually American in American painting failed dismally. Yet, and yet, in a mysterious way, we know that there is such a thing as American art. Though it is difficult to say precisely when it became more than a mere offshoot and what characteristics make it American. Echoes of support <clears throat> for the Whitney Museum, uh, who founded this vision for American art, continue today. Similarly, I think that in the minds of at least some, the concept of Mormon art, 
whatever the, its definition, exists. American art has certainly taken shape since those early 20th century discussions in large me measure because of early advocacy and significant support and scholarship. To Richard Bushman, Mormon art is the next frontier. We are at the start of something historic. There are notes, papers, and an archive being gathered of the work we are doing and of the discussions being had. Much like what Gertrude Whitney did for American art, I certainly hope that this festival and the others that will follow will influence definitions, cultivate greater artistic production, and expand the notion of Mormon art out of its perceived colloquial status. And to what end do these definitions and cultural pro products, identities, and varied expressions matter? Well, to me, they matter a great deal. Thank you.